Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Dark Souls 2. Necromanticer here, and hopefully recording will go a little bit better this time. I made sure not to ditz about on any of my higher level characters, just to be sure that I've got the lower adaptability down and can really adjust to the playstyle of playing on a growing character rather than someone who's already at the end of things. In this episode, I'm going to be heading all the way through the Shaded Woods, and hopefully we're going to have a spider to kill at the very end, so... Fingers crossed on that respect. It might take a bit long, but we'll have to see as the episode progresses. Depending upon how I clear through the areas, it might not be that long at all, so we shall see. Just to make this encounter a little bit easier for yourself, you want to kill at least one or two of the goblins that are down here before you actually activate the ambush, because the moment you do, all those doors are going to open up and... All the goblins from above are going to pour down at you. Not a particularly fun encounter, let me just say. Luckily, the axe has a very wide sweeping moveset, so I'm actually pretty confident that it will take care of this fight no problem. Just walk around a little bit, regain some stamina, and come back into the fray. Yeah, very quick fight, very simple, just because of the moveset of the axe. The basilisk can't do anything versus this. I'm not going to talk to Rosabeth just because I'm not going to need her for some time. You know, on second thought, I am going to talk to her at least so that I can have a uh, pyromancy trainer somewhere in Majula because Carillion's not going to be there for me. There we go. You do have to give her some semblance of clothing in order to get her to move back, but that's not too big of an issue. Usually the brigand sets something that I'm never going to use, so I can just toss that her way. Okay, and just some sort of clothes. Yeah, there we go. And just talk to her a little bit more, and she will head back to Majula and be your friend little merchant for all time. Supposedly, she actually had a drop quest line in that you could... There was going to be a specific dress that you could give her. I believe Hellkite Drake one of the YouTubers who covers some of the cut content for Souls games. He really digs around in the files and finds some pretty unique stuff. But he put up something on that a little while ago, and you might want to check that out if you're wondering why exactly she can be given clothing, because it is a really strange mechanic. It really doesn't fit in with Souls all too well, but eh, that's what the devs decided to put in there, so that's the game we have. Come right on through. I don't bother resting at that bonfire just because you only had to kill like five or six enemies before you could leave that encounter. So your weapon didn't take that much durability damage. Your health should be fine. You probably didn't waste any Estus. And you can just come right on through. The next bonfire, as is kind of the case in Dark Souls 2, is pretty close. So you really don't have anything to worry about just clearing right on through. Luckily, I can kill these guys in a singular strong attack. Really makes my day. These weapons are just in such a powerful spot for this portion of the game. This is right around when you're supposed to be getting a level 7 weapon, but because my strength is already at max and I've got two level 7 weapons, I, I really am just in a very powerful position to take on most of these enemies. You're really not supposed to be able to clear through with such ease. And I, I guess it is really a matter of skill, like some people can clear through the entire game with ease no matter what weapon they're using, but I, I really feel like the game was supposed to be a little bit more challenging. And it probably isn't on my first run, but now that I'm really used to the game and it's all of its mechanics and the new weapons, it's gotten to be a little bit easier, at the very least. Get the double kill. They have very weird weapon drops, but there are quite a few enemies in the game who just have drops that are very, very strange. Like, the spiders in Seldora are actually a really wonderful example. I've seen an explanation somewhere that uh, they're based on certain spiders in real life that have a hoarder tendency, but it, it's just a very, very strange way of giving the player loot. Like... 
drops from a spider really make very little sense, and more so than most of the drops. Because, to be entirely honest, the drop system is just a game mechanic, and you can't read entirely too much into it, but sometimes it makes sense, and sometimes it just doesn't even try. This guy can be a little bit tricky, but he gets a little bit focused sometimes. Good. There we go. And now he's dead. See, the damage on this is just so wonderful because it you just keep swinging. It's like a woodsman. Every, every enemy in your path is just going to fall right on down. Shield Lothlosian's Crescent Axe. It, it is a very strange thing that that's actually found right alongside a falconer's shield, but I, I just take that as he was fighting a falconer when he died. I mean, that that's as close as I can read into it. It, it really wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for Shield Loth Lothian's corpse to have a shield on it. So you just kind of have to draw your own conclusions, and that's what I try to go with. As you can see, he was stopped in the rubble there, and you could take that as he was crushed by the rubble, but I don't know. It's just a very strange situation to, in general. The drop there is kind of weird. I believe that's both of the... that's Creighton and Pate, so they, the dual scene will be all ready for me when I make my way finally past all this nonsense and into Seldora proper. Uh, depending upon whether or not I actually grab Pate's armor, I try to kill Creighton most of the time, but I think on this character I'm gonna kill Pate just because Creighton's armor would look a lot better and really fit more. Oh. That's the one problem with these guys. They can combo you really well, and if you turn your back to them at all, they will get a backstab, and you will regret life in general. Because they're wielding very fast weapons, and some of them actually have daggers, which will put you out of your misery almost instantly if they actually connect with the backstab. There's the old sun ring there. It's actually got a kind of nice buff recently in that the explosion it drops no longer drops it actually maintains its position according to your body so it's no longer going to just completely whiff because the combo carried both of you outside of the range of the explosion now it's a matter of if they keep attacking you they're gonna be in range of the explosion just as a matter of course they can't escape the explosion just by continuing forward with their, with their combo, and so now it really fulfills the role it was supposed to in discouraging people from stunlocking you or just carrying you away with really fast weapons. Not that that's really as much of a problem anymore because they nerfed uh, stunlock capacity, but it's just something to note. Learn his gesture. I'm going to go through all the talk options because I really do want his helmet. That's going to be one of the key pieces of the uh, cosplay later on, and the sooner I can grab that, the better. He does have a few things for sale, but I'm not going to need any of them. I don't really want the... at least just yet. I don't want the Claymore, because it's far too knightly a weapon, and it doesn't scale as well off of strength as the weapons I intend to be using. However, the Red Rust equipment I will probably be coming back to pick up later. At this point, the real question I'm having for this playthrough is whether I want to use my Titanite to upgrade my armor, or to actually be able to use the Red Rust Swords effectively. If I were to be grabbing one of the Red Rust Swords, I would want to make it the Scimitar just because I already have an axe, and the Red Rust Sword itself purely shares the uh, moveset with the one-handed axe, so there's there'd be really no point in doubling up. Rest at the bonfire, and... Now, since I have, let's see, yeah, I have two Fragrant Branches of Yora, I can just clear through this area as I normally would. I like to grab the Fang Key fairly early, just so that I can head right on down to the Basilisk Chamber the moment that I get there. After I talk with the old Dark Diver Grandall at the very end of the level. As is my usual, I like to be able to clear through a level in a singular complete clear and this route really allows me to do that 
The one downside is that it drops you off at the very end of the level once you've fully cleared it, but since the run back to the uh, boss fight in this area isn't too much of an issue, I don't take that as too much of a bad side, especially because it allows you to bonfire up and have all your Estus ready for when you really want to face the boss. The short range weapons that I have are really going to do me right versus Nazca, especially because as long as you're staying close she can get really caught up in her own thing and try to do a bunch of fancy attacks with her tail that are just going to completely whiff. I want to make sure I grab that and now I can just clear my way on through. Magic bolts here. I mean they're useful if you're going to be enchanting a crossbow but generally speaking physical is the best idea for crossbows and the only thing I would really suggest Some people are so obnoxious. It's summer. I can't I can't record with the window closed. I would absolutely fry here, so just gonna have to deal with the little bit of noise coming in. As you can see, these Lion Clan warriors are extremely weak versus physical attacks, so you can just cleave right on through them if you have any sort of really powerful physical weapon, as I actually have two, so it's really nice. I'm going to one-hand this so that I can get the drop on the Titanite Lizard. Oh, not quite. Let's try that again. There we go. This is the first guaranteed bolt stone of the playthrough, so if you're running oh, if you're running a faith build, that's definitely a Crystal Lizard you're not wanna going to want to pass up because... <sighs> those little, little bumps there can just give you so much trouble if you're not placing your rolls very specifically. This always makes me feel a little bit bad, but it's too much of a hassle to go through his quest line, and I'm not going to be summoning him, summoning him for the boss, so he's got to go. As you can see, this really short-range moveset, while it didn't really come into play, is perfect for taking him on just because he has a very forward-focused attack pattern, and you can just hack away at him from behind especially if you're circling to your left without any sort of repercussion. This is always a bit of a wonky encounter just because how that uh, Lion Clan Warrior aggros is a little bit weird. He can do a few little stutter steps there at the beginning before he really gets into the combat and that can allow you to get a really quick backstab. And because he's so weak to physical damage that just absolutely destroyed him. That's all this area taken care of. If I had another Fragrant Branch, which I can't imagine why I would, I could have just activated the final, well, not the final, but uh, one of the last Petrified Lion Knights here in this area in order to uh, just complete that little circular shortcut or loot area, but I didn't want to bother, especially because I only have one Fragrant Branch left and it only dumps you off at the Basilisk that I killed at the very beginning of this level so there'd be no point in me taking that shortcut aside from heading back to the bonfire if I wanted to repair my weapon or gain back that smidge of health that I'm missing. This uh, really large Basilisk here you can take out in a pair of ways. You can risk melee combat trying to kite around and just fight it from behind or you can do the smart thing and spend four quick poison throwing knives and just head on through the level. It'll take three cycles of poison throwing knives to kill it, but as long as you're diligent about coming back, especially interspersing that with a little bit of clearing through the level for treasure, the uh, really large basilisk won't give you any sorts of problems. You can just deal with the level as you normally would and he'll still be waiting there his health bar ticking away as you gather up all the loot. Because I pulled off that early combo, I can just come in and clear him off while he tries to poison me and petrify me, goodness. And he drops a petrified dragon bone. Th those are a little bit more prolific now that the DLC uh, gives us a lot of them, but in the base game they're still pretty hard to come by, especially early, so you want to get as many of those as possible wherever you can. What's really frustrating is that you can actually lose that drop if you die 
right after killing the basilisk, which has happened to me once or twice when I killed it and accidentally carried myself forward into its petrifying spray. It was a really frustrating circumstance all around, but it was only one petrified dragon bone, so it wasn't too much of a shame. It was just a little bit of an inconvenience, especially for where I was at the game. Always activate this lion if you have the chance, because in the chest is another fragrant branch to completely replace the one you just spent, so there's never any downside to opening up that little bit of loot. It'll always be worthwhile because it replaces itself and just gives you that little bit of treasure there. More Skeptic Spice and a Soul of a Brave Warrior. If you tag that uh, mini precipice that's broken out of the wall on your way down, it won't give you any fall damage. Now, I don't need this just because it's a sorcery, but I want the soul mass anyways. It's nice if you're planning on going into a sorcerer later on down the road. Dark Diver Grandall here in his really luxurious wheelchair. The dark is still nascent, so uh, nothing to be done about this now, but you want to make sure you talk to him the first time you head through each area, just so you don't have to do a little bit of backtracking once you finally unlock all of his locations. Hmm? Okay, I don't need the weapon durability. I am going to be resting at the bonfire just to... You know, considering that my weapon durability is actually pretty okay, and I've only taken a few hits throughout the level, I don't actually think I am going to rest at the bonfire. I'm just going to head right on through to Nashka. And that is a full clear of this level. It takes you all the way through every single one of the undercrofts there that give you the little bits of loot, whether it's the magic bolts or the uh, Black Knight weapon. Mess this on up, and I'm actually set to run right on through to the boss. The only thing that this route doesn't do for you is destroy the singular curse jar that's up in that that's standing above the doorway and there's just no point to take that out because if you're running and rolling properly you can still make your way through that area without getting cursed even at base curse resist so so long as you're planning out your moves properly you can clear out this entire area in one fell swoop and then run straight on through to the boss I really like that aspect and really makes me happy it's it's very satisfying the architecture in here is a little bit weird there's no point in a lot of this, but it's a cool looking area. Here we hit upon one of the most frustrating things in the entire game. That little drop hanging on the log over there. It's such a worthless item. It's, it's just a single flame butterfly. And yet, the way you have to go about getting it is so ridiculously uh, risky that it's just not worth it ever such a bait and switch. It really makes you feel that it would be a really worthwhile item because they put it in a boss fight for crying out loud. Not only is it in a boss fight with an incredibly dangerous way of actually grabbing it, but it, you have such a chance of missing it, especially because it's completely uh, unable to be attained once you've completed the boss fight. If you don't grab it as you're clearing through Najka, there is no chance of you ever getting it. And so, you really feel like it should be some really important and powerful item that really rewards you for... Oh, ouch. That rewards you for taking the time and risk and effort to get her to smash that log for you. And in the end, it's just a single flame butterfly. It's such a letdown. She has one of those attacks where, while she's stuck in her animation, she actually gets heavily increased defenses, but... It's no big deal. Most of her really long attacks leave her wide open to attack on the sides where she doesn't have as much defenses. And uh, most of her attacks in general just have a very difficult chance of hitting you. Like, if she ever tries that move, just hug her side on either side, really. And it will sweep all the way around and never touch you at all. It's a very easy fight, especially if you have a up-close melee weapon like I do. It's a little bit more difficult at range, but... If you can kite around properly, you won't have too difficult of a time of it. The only really threatening move in her entire fight, in my opinion, is the uh, homing soul mass that she creates, because it actually triggers twice, and if you're rolling for the first one, 
especially if you have lower adaptability or don't have enough distance, she will hit you with the second one almost guaranteed. Oh. That arc. Kind of annoying, but... Let's roll through it this time. Oh, I can just tank it. The bonfire is right there. Come on through. But the real trick to avoiding her soul mass attack is to... Uh, just, instead of trying to roll or anything tricky, just sprint entirely perpendicular to her, whichever way she's facing you from, and you'll avoid it ten times out of ten. It's one of those moves that really rewards you for not trying to roll the entire time, but actually use just your regular locomotion in order to avoid damage. That's something that I see a lot of really new players really struggling to pick up on, is that rolling, while it does give you pure invincibility, is not always the best manner to avoid damage. Not only does it take up a lot of stamina, but it also forces you to reposition, ties up your character in an animation for a little while, and can uh, catch you completely out when you're standing up from the roll, since you can't begin another roll right away. So that's just always something to consider when you're judging how best to deal with the situation in combat. Always good to remember that rolling is not always the best option. This doesn't really hold true for PvP because you really need DI frames to deal with phantom range and lag in connectivity, but clearing through PvE, that is honestly one of the biggest tips that I can provide any new players is don't always rely on rolling in order to carry you through an encounter. It's not always going to be the best way to clear an enemy. Coming through here, I'm really happy that I have the blacksmith's hammer because these guys, while they're a bit strong versus physical damage most of the time, their blunt defenses, as with most armored opponents, is a, bit, a little bit lower. So I can use this to get that little bit of extra damage. Gavlan's here, and I want to grab a few more poison throwing knives because I've been using a bit of them and want to have at least enough to make sure the giants aren't much of a difficulty. I'm not going to bother selling anything because I don't have too terribly much because I've been clearing pretty straightforward. But I will come back at least off camera later on in the playthrough in order to sell off a bunch of the crap that I'm not going to need. I always make sure to keep at least one piece of every... Uh, armor and weapon that I have, just in case I want to use it later, but the amount of multiples I have right now is pretty sickening, so... And it's just going to get worse by the time I get to late game. Come on, right through there. If you hug the right-hand wall while you're running up to that Titanite Lizard, it'll give you that much more time to deal with him, and because I have the one-handed axe to deal with him, it's a very simple encounter. I can just have one quick overhead swing, and the Crystal Lizard is history. It gives you some large Titanite if you're struggling to get that last little bit in order to upgrade another weapon or a bit of armor to plus six, so that can be a really useful Lizard, especially for if you're not heading into the Iron Keep after you clear through the little bit of the Bastille. It allows you to just finish up those upgrades and really head on with the game if you're a little bit lower on them, I suppose. These guys try to ambush you, but as you can see, that's working out rather well for them. Goodness. Let's just heal that away. I'm not going to bother with actually resting at the bonfire, as I did earlier, because, again, the distance between the bonfire there in... Uh, the Doors of Pharos and the next bonfire on the road is very short and simple. I am going to at least touch the bonfire here just so I can have it as a warp-in option and I will have it as a checkpoint just in case I manage to flood this next little section. But I don't foresee that happening, it's just a matter of being cautious. Walk around these guys. I'm going to switch to my blacksmith hammer just because I want those sweeping attacks from the bandit axe to be saved for the boss encounter here. The boss encounter right before the next bonfire is one of those really silly fights where they just tacked on a bunch of extra opponents in order to try and make it hard 
And so long as you have any sort of crowd controlling, really sweeping attacks, like great swords especially work well in that next encounter. It's a bit of a breeze. It's one of those fights that really makes a good case for itself as contender for one of the easiest boss fights in the game, but I do like it in the respect that it doesn't give you any sorts of boss soul that is just going to sit in my inventory at least for most of the game. It gives you a Titanite slab instead, and the Prowling Magus itself actually has a chance to drop both the small shield that I was marking about Merciless Rowena, as well as the Warlock Mask that Rowena also has. Immediately come forward, try and lock them into an animation, and the boulder will do all of your work for you. They do have a chance of being a little bit faster than you are, but so long as you're fighting predictively, you should be able to swing right where they're going to be coming at you and stave them off that way. Also, sprinting attacks, as always, are one of your best friends. Come on through here. little soul for you. I do have a lot of souls, but I've, again, I've got the bonfire coming right up, so I don't really have to worry about those just yet. Those of you who were paying attention may have noticed that I didn't enter the PvP section of the Doors of Pharos, and that was very much intentional. I really don't need anything there, as the only really worthwhile bit of loot there, I think, is the guaranteed... Well, there's several bits of loot, but none of them I'm going to be using on this character, and the only really unique piece of loot there that I think is kind of mandatory depending upon your playthrough is the guaranteed faint stone as it's one of the first faint stone you can get in the entire game and for the price of a single ferris lock stone you can get it at this point because prior to this your only options for getting faint stone are the basilisks and oh that was that was bad let's let's back it up and try that again there we are they do have a chance to really gang up on you, so every time you strike in, you want to pull back immediately. Fighting multiples of them, especially because of the way their damage comes out, is just a really terrible mistake in my opinion. These are, again, some of the more annoying enemies in that their damage comes out before they actually get to you, and so even if you trade blows with them, you're always going to be taking damage off of it. Come right on through to this little secret. It's a really wonderfully designed secret because if you actually look down at the church from earlier in the level, I don't know if I actually focused on it, but if you rewind, you probably can see it at least in a few of the frames. But you can actually see that corpse hanging over the window there with an item, and so it really alerts you that, hey, there's something down there. I'm going to have to look around for that. At first when I saw that, I immediately started looking for secrets down in this area, and that's actually how I managed to find... What's his face? Uh, the Pardoner. Cromwell the Pardoner on my first playthrough. But it took me even longer to realize, oh wait, no, that wasn't the secret that I could see from earlier in the level. Oh. Should not have backed off to let her heal. Her, him. I actually think that one of the priests is a her and the other is a him just because they have such different health bars. What kills one is not enough to kill the other, and so I think that's them just uh, demarcating the different genders as more frail or whatnot. I don't honestly bother about avoiding the hit there just because I can tank through it no problem. This is one of the best little bits of design that I think they have in the entire game is if you immediately come out and you're just kind of looking around, you see this pot over there. That pot has no reason to be there. If you come on over, you break it, there's nothing inside. It's just a piece of trash. It's a bit of rubble. It's, it has nothing. Because of the way the chapel is designed, it's a little bit difficult, if you can't see that, to even notice that there's a doorway there or that there's anything in this little culvert. But seeing that pot gets the player thinking, well, this place is kind of symmetrical. If there's something in this little alcove over here, I wonder what's in this little alcove over here. And that's how they really lead you 
to finding Cromwell if you don't necessarily know where he is. As I said, I was specifically looking around for secrets because I saw the body hanging over the window earlier in the level, and that's how I knew to look for secrets, and that's how I found the pot, and that's how I found this ladder on my first playthrough. But I just... It, it really is those little bits of wonderful level design that really makes FromSoft a step above the rest. They really understand the psychology of the player, and they really draw your eye. I'm probably not going to use it, but Scraps of Life is one of the best hexes in the game, and so I always make sure to pick up any copies of that when I have the chance. Especially if you're going to be trans... Uh, translating your character into a hexer in higher new game cycles, you want to have at least that little modicum of extra spells from the earlier cycles that you can't access the merchants from anymore. I'm not going to spend these souls just yet because there is a little bit of really quick clearing that needs to be done. Not only is this lizard here, but there's also this little drop that gives you a pair of Titanite chunks, which is enough to upgrade my Vandit Axe once again. Since I'm really using that to clear most of the main enemies in this playthrough, I think I'm going to be focusing on getting that to plus 10 before I uh, get the Blacksmith's Hammer to plus 10. But that's just because it is more useful for clearing groups of enemies, which is the main source of adversity that I'm coming across, as opposed to the Blacksmith's Hammer, which I really like for clearing bosses. Reinforce that. Oh, I actually can upgrade both of them. Must have picked up some other Titanite chunks along the way. That's, that's really wonderful. I was going to keep them even for that little much longer. I also have a large portion of souls to spend here, as well as a few SS Flash shards. Spend all these. I don't believe I have another ascetic. I mean, not ascetic, but... Ah... Uh, Sublime Bone Dust just yet, so I'm not going to bother with that. I want to get my agility up to 105 just so I can stop worrying about that, and my other combat stats are at a pretty nice value. The only thing that I could would really want to add to them is maybe taking them all the way up to 30 as opposed to just leaving them at 20s, but 20 is a very strong amount to leave your regular combat stats at, especially for the early game before you've headed through the Shrine of Winter, so... I'm not going to worry too much about it. Come over here and grab this little proud knight. I like how they hid some of the corpses in pots. Uh, it really gives you that much more of an incentive to sort of break your way through the level. Um, just because I want it, I'm going to head right down here, grab not only the large titanite shard that's hanging off this ledge, but in the area right below this is an Estus Flash Shard. It does sacrifice the full clear of the level, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I kind of dislike this level, just because it's one of those ones that doesn't allow you to full clear all in one run, but that's how they wanted to set up the game, so I guess I just kind of have to deal with it. Grab the Petrified Dragonbone. Because we used the Fang Key earlier on, Orn Effects is sitting pretty over here, just kind of waiting around for you. She can actually be used to upgrade your weapons or repair weapons mid-level. She also, in gratitude, allows you to get at least one boss soul weapon for free the first time, but at this point in the game you have nothing that you're really going to want. The only things that maybe if you want to use a particularly funky strength build, you could use the Iron King Hammer or if you really want a good spear and are using a faith build, the Dragon Slayer spear is there for you, but really there's nothing here. The Murakumo makes its first regular appearance, and also the Twin Blade. The only composite bow you can get in the game is here. The only real thing that you want from her is her fire arrows, if you're going to be an archer. I don't rate the bolts at all, as well as once you reach late game, she'll sell infinite amber herbs for all you spellcasters out there. She has a few spells, but none of them are really worthwhile, especially because there are better versions of all of them. 
Ignore the red titanite lizard just because it's a complete trap. There's never a, chance, a time when you really want to be fighting that. It's just going to explode on you and you're going to take damage. Try to switch up the weapons here just so that I'm splitting the durability because this is one of those longer levels. One of the ones that has a chance of breaking your weapon, especially by the end if you're going to be heading all the way through to the boss. So you just kind of want to be careful of that. The Crescent Axe there got a buff in this most recent patch, but it's still in a pretty weak spot, and that really makes me sad, because I love its moveset, and it's got the two-handed axe moveset, but with a much, much larger range on it, and that makes me really want it to be... Oh, makes me want it to be viable really bad, but it just lacks the damage necessary in order to... Uh, really make it worthwhile. As you saw with that first spider enemy, he managed to kill, uh, get his hit off even after he died. And that's just one of the sad things about the design here. It sort of makes sense because the spider and the corpse it's holding on to are technically different entities. They're not actually the same creature. It's just a spider holding on to a corpse, as you can clearly see, but it is a very frustrating enemy design, and I, I don't rate it at all. It's a really unfair thing to do to the player, and it's just one of the one of the gripes I have with Dark Souls 2. They are there. It's not a perfect game, but I do I do really like it, and I think it does a lot right. So I try to at least focus on the good when I can, and just call out the bad when it's in your face like that. As long as you just kite back when you're running low on stamina and make sure to stagger him consistently. He's not too much of a threat. He's a little bit funny just because he really lets you in on the secret that bringing a pig down here will give you access to the uh, pickaxe. The, oh. That one, I will agree, was a little bit of trade damage. It wasn't necessarily the game's fault that I took damage there, so I'll accept it. But the mushrooms on the floor... Oh. Let's be a little bit careful about this. These little mushrooms or truffles or whatever you want to call them are actually hiding the pickaxe, which... Well, it is a kind of funny weapon. It's it's more of a joke weapon than anything else. It's a reference all the way back to Demon Souls, where the uh, pickaxe was one of the first thrust weapons you could get. And it was pretty rubbish for everything except for the first area that you could grab it. It was brought back in Dark Souls 2 and actually was fairly decent. It wasn't something that you wanted to be using a whole lot of, but if you wanted to abuse the Leo Ring counter damage, it was one of the best strength options for that because it allowed you to get the thrust damage with a pretty high base damage and B scaling and strength. So depending upon what kind of gimmick build you were going for, it might actually see some use. And now here in Dark Souls 2, it's just a kind of pathetic great hammer type weapon. Its moveset is pretty piss poor and the only gimmick it really has is that it can pierce through armor which isn't isn't really saying too much for it since any sort of weapon like that is paying heavily for the special attack option there and its moveset doesn't really do it any favors either. So if you want to spend the time and effort to drag one of the boars from earlier in uh, Brightstone Cove all the way down to those truffles, you can get them to eat it, but again, only do that if you really want to have a little bit of a gimmick or make a funny build. I remember the peasant build that only Afro did was <laughs> pretty entertaining, but yeah, it, it, it really is only for the gimmick of it's a pickaxe. It's a funny weapon. Use it for the lulls, and don't really expect too much out of it. It's not going to carry you through PvP by any stretch. And in PvE, it's probably even worse, just because the Great Hammer is not a... or at least its moveset is not too great for clearing PvE. The one bad thing about the uh, mace is that the spinning sprinting attack is actually a really poor attack. So... It's not going to do me any favors versus these spiders down here. That's just going to be a matter of 
slashing through them normally with the regular mace moveset. Hammer moveset, I guess. They are very similar, but the mace has that really wonky one-handed attack that I don't like. And the hammer has the really nice sweeping one-handed attack that I do like. And that's all the enemies... Oh. I wanted to go in there with full health, but he wouldn't let me. That's all the enemies down here. Time to face the boss. I am going to make at least two more runs back in the level proper in order to clear some of the secrets and grab up all the extra items that I passed over. But I wanted to head right on through to this boss fight just because I was clearing through the level so efficiently. I actually have a lore video specifically on this boss fight. A little collaboration between me and another channel that's been doing a lot of Dark Souls content. Uh, Bitter Bits that you might want to check out. I'll see if I can leave an annotation there. But there is there is a lot of lore in this level, especially regarding Aldia and his possible involvement here. And I really, really like that aspect, especially just because I think Aldia is the most interesting character in Dark Souls 2. I'll have more to say on him later, but just knowing ahead of time that Aldia is pretty much everywhere the plot is, and if there's something important going on in Drang Lake, Aldia had something to do with it, I almost guarantee it. Just kind of avoid all that. He even has some uh, attachments in the DLC, which is really weird because of the sort of time... Oh, that's not good. Oh, this is really bad. This is really bad. The only time that you really should uh, have an excuse to get hit by... What's going on here? What's go... Huh. It, it wasn't letting me move properly, but the webbing had gone away. And it wasn't letting me Estus. Getting knocked down during that webbing must have kind of glitched that out, but... That was a little bit frustrating. I mean, it literally took control of my character away. I, I had no way of surviving that. It wouldn't let me Estus, and it wouldn't let me move, even though the webbing had worn off, so... Hmm. I'll just go down there and get those souls back a little bit after clearing through one of these side paths in this area. Come on down here. Because I spoke to both Pate and Creighton, they're already at each other's throats right here, and you can pick which one of them you want to aid. It's kind of funny, because you would expect Pate to really fail at this fight, just because he's kind of a sissy. He, he really doesn't strike me as the type to get in on the action. And yet, the fact that he has a great shield and a spear really allow him to dominate Creighton in this fight. Creighton has a very difficult time if you just leave them to duke it out. He will give you... They will both give you the den key for later on in the level, and Creighton actually is really nice and gives you his full set of armor. There isn't a, a completely in-character explanation for why he does that, but I'm not going to go too far into that now. Just suffice it to say, he's kind of a bad dude, and... He, he is much more of a villain than Pate will ever be. Pate's just kind of taking advantage of people. Creighton is actually a stone-cold killer and kind of wants to remove a little bit of suspicion from himself by having you walk around in his armor set. What a good dude. Wait for him to whiff that. Oh, you see? I killed him and then I take damage. So frustrating. Come on and grab the tight neck chunk. I believe that's three chunks. No, only two. Could have sworn, but yeah. One more chunk and I will have enough to get my bandit axe to one more upgrade level. And that's always something I'm a fan of. You want to kill him before you head on into the encounter right here, just because he's going to be clinking away at you with homing soul arrows if you don't. Ugh. Is that post-mortem attack again. I'm going to use the axe because it has the slashing moveset. Uh, they have a little bit less defense versus. And so, oh, got caught on the boxes. And so it will actually fully kill them in two hits, especially with proper sweet spots, as opposed to the 
Blacksmith's Hammer, which wasn't really doing it for me. It was taking three hits to kill them, and you can only get two free hits after they whiff. The third one actually will trade with their death blow. So you want to make sure to avoid that, if at all possible. Southern Ritual Man plus one, for those of you who don't want to ascetic Najka and want those few extra spell casts. It's pretty nice for so early in the game. Come on down here. It is just kind of one of those really strange design decisions, though, is that they give that to you after you have access to the superior ring. It's a lot like in the Iron Keep, where they allow you to get the Gold Serpent Ring plus one, and then hand you the regular Serpent Ring. In fact, they did that with both Serpent Rings, so it's just a little bit of a confusing design decision. You want to be sure to take this out at range because... Oh, hello. Otherwise, the sand that's built up behind it... Usually they come in pairs. Definitely broke the door down, so the other one just might be caught here, yeah. Hadn't quite aggroed properly. As I was saying, you want to take down this door at range because the sand that's piled up behind it will just get a bit of free damage on you if you try and break it in melee. Two direct hits with any sorts of throwing projectile will take it out. Nothing else here besides the little den behind this pair of doors. This one locked, and that's why you need to get the crate and pate event. Grab this chest first, just because it's not trapped. And it has the really worthwhile piece of loot, the engraved gauntlets, which will give you a 5% chance of scoring a critical attack even with regular blows. And that little bomb there contains 10 rusted coins. If you left Pate alive and got the den key from him, he'll actually snicker at you and uh, kind of mock you when the bomb goes off, so it's quite clear that he knows that was there. But at the same time, it's not like he told you to go grab that or uh, really forced your hand in any way, so he's not necessarily culpable. It's just a little bit of a more gray area, whereas Creighton is as far from a gray area as you can get. He is just straight up a serial killer and doesn't really want to be brought to justice. Oh. Let's, let's back this off. I don't want to lose all those souls that I have down there in the boss chamber. This fight's getting a little bit dicey. Okay, there we are. That's just one more time. Bring out the bandit axe, just get both of these guys at once. And now I can head right on down. The Seldora cap, a little bit of extra souls if you want it. I personally don't think the Seldora set looks good with very many items except for itself. So the only real options if you're going to be wearing anything from Seldora is either to wear the full set or just the leggings and the chest piece because everything else looks terrible with any other set. The cap is really dorky and as well as the uh, kill him. The gauntlets which honestly provide the highest boost to souls. They actually give you a full 10% bonus uh, as opposed to most of the other pieces which when totaled give you about a 20% bonus altogether. But the hand pieces actually look extremely dainty and frilly and just very poor for any sort of warrior character. It's only good for if you're running like a noble cosplay using the full Seldora set. Come right on through here. Immediately start running. The trick about this fight is avoiding Freya while you can get rid of some of her adds. Get some damage if you have the chance. I mean, never pass up free damage because you are going to want to run around her in order to both kite away from her attacks as well as take some time to clear these spiderlings. And so long as you just keep in motion, never standing still, never uh, sitting there for her to bash on, then you should have a pretty easy time with this fight, especially with a little bit of a sweeping attack like that. Uh, oh, there we are. That should be all of her spiderlings, and I can really focus on Freya this time. Oh. This is one of her few, like, 
attacks that can really catch you off guard because she actually attacks from both faces at once as opposed to just from one. Come in and swing from the side. This is why I love the maces because you can just dart in without locking on and still get very accurate hits by just turning your side towards the boss. Just get a hit, run around when she locks herself into an animation. Come away if she tries that because again one of the hits that's going to get you from either side. You just want to make sure that acid doesn't get anywhere near you. Get some unlocked hits. Lock her into an animation. Run around. And that's Freya for you. That's how that, spikes, that fight is supposed to go down. Victory achieved. Embrace her great soul. And come on over here. There's Vengarl down below as well as Lord Seldora. He's entirely hollow. He's lost his soul. He's finally become a little spider along with Freya over there. The, I can clear it up a bit for you, but uh, I, there, again, there's a whole lore video on that that I'll be linking both in the description and have an annotation on screen, so you don't need to, me to go over it as I'm playing through. Vengarl is this really monstrous guy. You can clearly see why he had no trouble with wielding the Red Rust Swords, which were supposed to be a real test of strength for the Far End Lion Knights. Speaking of which, I completely glanced over that the Shaded Woods and the surrounding area is the ancestral home of Ferosa, which is where Far End is actually uh, really worshipped as highly as possible. That's where the Lion Knights were formed, which were his main... Uh, gonna start getting my decks up now because Amana is coming up. And I'm gonna want the 20 decks to be able to wield the Red Iron Twin Blade when I get there. As well as, it's just... I, I don't really need anywhere else to put the stats. I've got my Agility to 105. And my combat stats are pretty pretty happy where they are now. I'll start putting some into there once I get to absolute end game, but that's not necessary at the moment. And that'll be the last Estus shard. Did I get another chunk? Let me check. Yeah, I did not, so no upgrades just yet. I'm just going to do the final section of Seldora because I do want to activate the bonfire down below because it's the quickest way to use Orn effects once I have a few more souls that I want to run her way. I do have the Poison Throwing Knives equipped. Uh, one option, if you're here, is instead of heading down those stairs, you can just make a jump from right there and it'll take you the same place either way. Can we clear out this spider just so he doesn't pose any issues? This is one of the more frustrating sections of Sildora is that this hollow mage is going to constantly be giving you trouble and as you can see the homing soul masses that it's throwing my way will actually stagger you and drop you down so you do have to kill it or take advantage of one of the lapses in its attack pattern in order to uh, head down this little um, zipline effectively. This is where the lightning short bow comes in. I'm also just going to use the fire arrows for that little bit of extra damage. If it would allow me to get the kill. There we go. Oh! If it locks itself behind that uh, post, you can actually slide down without a problem. But yeah, that's just one of the more frustrating enemy positionings in the game. The hollow mages themselves aren't too big of a deal, especially because I have so much Estus and I'm coming right on through. Honestly, I almost have max Estus at this point, but they are annoying in that they will stagger you down from the zip lines. and if you get staggered on the zip line coming down to this bonfire location, you will actually be dropped right into the whirling sand pit of death and die immediately, so that is something you want to avoid if at all possible. As you can see, the spiders have just the strangest drops. Like, why does that have a mail breaker? 
who can say? But it has it, so. Eh. The one good thing about them is that not only do they have a chance to drop the uh, Rickard's Rapier, but they can also drop Zweihanders if you didn't pick one up the one up from the Iron Keep, whether you just didn't make it there yet or whatever reason. But they are kind of a nice place to get a few specialty weapons. They're also the first place in the game where you can get the Mastodon Greatsword if you're intending on using that. But that kind of clears this all up. I have taken out another Great Soul, and I've got both my weapons to plus eight. I'm doing pretty well on the ring front, and yeah, I'm making really good time. I will see you all next time as Faram slashes his way all the way down into the gutter. Not really looking forward to that, but that's what's next. See you all next time.